Good morning. Welcome to our worship service on this beautiful hot day, but if it's that S word isn't in the forecast, it's always a glorious day, right? So uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, as a, a reminder, uh, Pastor Mark is gone in the pa- next couple of Sundays uh, to deal with some personal matters, so I will be filling the pulpit. And please take a moment to uh, read the highlights for what's going on in our church. Another reminder uh, for the sermon and the uh, prayer, please feel free to remove your masks if you're comfortable with that. Uh, after that, start, you know, get up and move around for communion. We'll put, put the masks back on. But you saw this morning, no temperature checks at the door, so we're moving in the right direction, okay? So we will get there. But let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship as I read from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Will those who are able please stand and join me in the call to worship? Our trust is in you, O God, and in you alone. We rejoice that God's love for us is stronger than our fear. Let us worship God, who is our refuge and strength. Let us praise God, who is the source of our peace.
be seated, please. And join me in the prayer of confession. O God of all creation, you know us completely at our best and at our worst. We confess the mistakes we have made and the good we have neglected, the promises we have broken and the duties we have ignored. Let the power of your love become a mighty force in our lives. Develop the faith you have given us and work through us for good. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. stand. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall never perish but shall have eternal life. Receive the good news that by God's grace in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you all. Come on up here. So how many of you, do you guys like cookies? Who here likes cookies? Okay. Now, when I was young, we had a cookie jar, right? And my mom would make cookies and put them in the cookie jar, but she would say that you can't have any before dinner, right? You can't spoil your dinner with cookies, okay? So, uh, you know... Seeing that cookie jar on the dinner table right before dinner was kind of a temptation. Do you guys know what a temptation is? It's something where someone, something or someone makes you do something that you're not really not supposed to do, okay? But the good news is that we have God always here to help us through temptations, okay? But remembering that cookie story reminded me of a song. You remember the song, Who Stole the Cookie from the Cookie Jar, right? Who, me, yes, you, not me, then who, right? And so as I was, pretty good job singing that, by the way, right? Okay. Um, but as I was thinking of those words to that song, it reminded me of the Bible story today where we had... Uh, Adam and Eve, we see Adam and Eve, they were tempted by a serpent, right? Not to eat an apple from a certain tree. And you know what they did? They ate the apple from the tree that they weren't supposed to do. But after they did it, they kind of sang a version of that song. Adam said, I didn't do it. She gave it to me. And then Eve said, it wasn't my fault. The snake told me to do it. So it reminded me kind of of that song, right? 
of who stole the cookie from the cookie jar where they're passing the blame around, okay? But the good news is that even when we are tempted, like Adam and Eve were, we don't have to think of that cookie jar song. We can think that God is there to help us through our temptations, okay? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much that even though we are tempted quite often with certain things, that you are always there to help us fight through that temptation. Thank you for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for always forgiving us. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. The Hebrew scripture this morning is Genesis 3, verses 8 through 15. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will shake, he will shake your head, and you will strike his heel. In the New Testament lesson, the Second Corinthians 4, verse 13 through, verse, through 5, Verse 1. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the Lord through the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasted away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen, for what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. gospel reading this morning comes from the third chapter of Mark, verses 20 through 35. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided... 
He cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man, then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers and sisters came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called for him. A crowd was sitting around Jesus, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside. They're asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers and sisters? And looking at those who sat around him, Jesus said, Here are my mother and my brothers and sisters. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now, I want you to be honest with me. Besides when you are sleeping, when was the last time that you spent more than an hour without looking at your phone? During 2018, TV producer and reality TV show judge Simon Cowell, you may remember him, he was interviewed and he stated that he had not used his mobile phone in almost a year. And he told that UK-based publication that it absolutely made me happier. Now, Simon Cowell, known for his work, as you might remember, on American Idol and his notorious on-air insults of everybody under the sun, he said that he, he used to get irritated when he had a meeting and everybody around him was on their phones. He said to the UK publication, I literally have not been on my phone for 10 months. And since he had given up his addictive phone habits, he noticed that he had been more focused on things that were going around on around him. He said that ditching his mobile phone has been so good for my mental health. It's a very strange experience, but it really is good for you, and it absolutely made me much happier. Cowell and many others have drawn attention to the importance of unplugging from cell phones as a way to improve our mood, health, and to cut down on distractions. In another study from the University of Helsinki, they tested participants between the ages of 13 and 24 on their ability to perform working memory and attention tasks. And what they found was that this younger generation had trouble filtering out the distractions, filtering out disturbances, and sticking to a particular task at hand. And let's face it, the coronavirus has not helped matters when it comes to distractions. Whether working from home or working from, uh, schooling from home, adults and teachers and students alike were asked to give 100% of their time to work or school while facing distractions such as pets, other family members, friends, and even the temptation to relax. Let's face it, all of us get distracted and have trouble focusing at times. But before we go further, what does it mean exactly to be distracted? Well, being distracted is being unable to concentrate because one's mind is preoccupied. 
Now, there's all sorts of things besides a cell phone that preoccupy us, right? We might ask ourselves some questions like, what about if this happens to me? We might have concerns over finances. We might have other questions about uncertainties that we face, like what career will I have? Who will I marry? Will I ever get married? When am I going to pass away? What if I get sick? I hope I can save enough money for retirement. These are all sorts of questions, and there's all sorts of things that just preoccupy us and distract us. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing inherently wrong with a distraction such as a cell phone or a gaming system, dare I say. But the issue is when we let things distract us and take our focus and our attention off of something more important. So a smartphone isn't bad, but if that smartphone is preventing a student from doing homework, then it's become an issue. There's nothing wrong with working a lot of hours, but it's consistently doing that coming at the expense of family time. Is it coming at the expense of missing a child's concert or event at school? Is worrying about our finances preventing us from showing kindness and compassion to someone in need? What is it that we are taking our focus off of by our distractions that we face? Remember that definition of distraction is that we're unable to concentrate on something. Well, what exactly is that? As a society, as a fellowship of Christ, people created by God, we are meant to be in relationship with one another and with God. That's who God created us to be. We are commanded to love God. We are commanded to love other people. But we, whether young or old, are more distracted than we ever have been. And that puts our relationships with each other and our relationships with God at risk. So it's when our distractions start interfering with our time, with our relationships with God and others, it's then that they start becoming problematic. We're shown some examples in this morning's readings of how to deal with distractions, how to deal with focusing on God. And let's face it, Jesus knew a little, well, okay, he knew quite a bit about dealing with distractions. And in our reading from the third chapter of Mark today, we see three parties that really attempt to distract Jesus from fulfilling his God-given mission. We see a crowd, we see his family, and then we also hear of the scribes. But first we hear about the crowd and that the crowd arrives. Now, as you read throughout the Gospels, Jesus is quite often swarmed by crowds of people. Through his actions and speaking about God's kingdom, Jesus was very magnetic. He was drawing and attracting crowds wherever he went. And in this scene, you'll notice that the crowd does not speak. This crowd doesn't express any worries or any concerns, but their actions of coming together that they, there were so many of them that came together that the reading this morning tells us that Jesus and the disciples were unable to eat. There were so many people. These people continually wanted more and more of Jesus, which could easily have distracted him at times. Then we hear about Jesus' family arriving, intending to seize Jesus. Now, why would they want to do that? Isn't he doing something good? Well, those who might know Jesus best, those who might have the most to lose if Jesus' ministry provokes the wrong people, his family just wanted to protect him and take him away. Mark says that those family members thought that he went crazy, that he's gone mad. They've determined that Jesus just isn't in his right mind. How could Jesus, the son of a carpenter, possibly do the things that he said he's done? And why would Jesus be challenging 
religious authorities and Roman occupation with his speech and his actions. Is he stupid to do something like that? No one in their right mind could or would think of doing those things. They have no explanation for his actions and what he's been saying since his ministry began when he was baptized in the Jordan River. And then the scribes come into the scene. They come from Jerusalem, prancing with their chests out, telling people, we know why Jesus has all this power. The scribes say that they know exactly why he's acting the way he is. This guy's possessed by the devil. That can be the only reason for Jesus doing what he's doing. Bottom line, people are getting nervous for and about Jesus. So Jesus' family in our reading this morning shows up again and they send a message to him stating that they're there to meet with him. And someone, I can imagine in this crowd, elbows Jesus and says, hey Jesus, your mom and your siblings are right over here. And one would think that he might get up and want to go see them. But it's as if he completely ignores that message and goes on to say, do you know who my mother and my brother and my sister are? Do you know who they are? They're those people that follow God's will. Those people are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. And so through these distractions, he, Jesus never let anything get in the way of his mission. Jesus came to us for one purpose and one purpose only. It was God's will that Jesus was to die for our sins, to bring us closer to God and give us all eternal life. And in this passage, we see three groups of people that didn't phase him one bit. While it seems at first to be a harsh diss of his mom and his siblings, Jesus was making a point, a very simple point, that if anything or anyone got in the way of his mission, the mission that God gave him, the reason why he came, then they had no place in his life. He didn't mean to be mean or nasty to his family. He was just pointing out that simple truth. Anyone who was impediment to that mission was not seen as a brother or sister in Christ. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus demonstrates this focus on God's will for his life and his mission. Take the feeding of the 5,000. The size of that crowd or the fact that even the disciples had no food to feed such a crowd could have easily taken Jesus' focus off of what he had to do. But he maintained that focus. He had compassion as soon as he looked at that crowd and told his disciples, go figure it out, you feed them. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus truly wanted the crucifixion not to happen. He was scared. He was afraid. Jesus simply did not want to die. But in the next breath, he refocused himself away from that distraction and remembered what God's will for his life was. Then there was rebuking Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends. When Jesus was explaining to the disciples what was about to happen to him, the suffering and the death that he was going to endure, Peter blurted out, that absolutely cannot happen. A kind of interjection that you or I might make if one of our best friends told us something crazy and ridiculous that was about to happen to them to lose their life. This unintentional distraction did not deter Jesus at all. He said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. This is just a stumbling block. It's not going to stop me on my journey. Jesus was laser focused on God's will and mission for his life. And he never let anything distract him from that happening. In this morning's reading from Genesis, we kind of see the opposite happen. We see the opposite in terms of focusing on God and dealing with distractions. In this passage, it starts off like we're going to get a nice, intimate interaction between God and Adam and Eve. Now, this takes place right after Adam and Eve have just eaten from the tree of life. 
something that God said, you can eat from every other tree in the garden, but don't eat from that tree. Well, they did. And then God comes into the garden, and Adam and Eve are immediately distracted. Now, if we can imagine God just making an entrance into our lives, we might be awestruck. We might want to immediately bask in God's glory, but that's not what Adam and Eve did. They were distracted by their own nakedness from eating from that tree. So they hid from God. They were too preoccupied with God's presence and were just simply unable to take that in. They were overcome with guilt and the inability to accept responsibility for what they did. And as such, what was initially meant to be an intimate interaction turned into a reprimand from God and a curse on the serpent. As a result of their guilt, they couldn't focus on anything but God, which ultimately led to their expulsion from paradise. And while it might be easy to point fingers at Adam and Eve for their decision-making and the resulting distractions, aren't we more similar to them in our actions than different? As followers of Christ, we've been given the inspired word of God. We've been given instruction on how to live our lives as Christians. We have the Holy Spirit within us to guide us. And yet, how often are we distracted from God? How often do we deviate from what God calls us to do? And how many times during the day does God attempt to enter our gardens and try to come to us, whether it's through another person, whether it's sitting in nature, whether it's a thought that we have, and we are too distracted by our sins and other things to notice God in our midst? How often are we ashamed of something that we have done that we're not proud of and we hide from God? No matter what we are or have been distracted by, there is absolutely no need from us to ever hide from God. Even with our shortcomings, God loves each one of us, and God seeks us out constantly and wants to know us intimately. So Adam and Eve taught us how to lose focus on God. Jesus taught us how we can focus on God. And some of us might think, well, but that example of Jesus, that's simply unattainable. Because it was because he had a divine connection with God, that's why he could maintain his focus. And with Adam and Eve, they were fully human. They succumbed to their distractions. Uh, We might feel hopeless when it comes to How can we maintain a constant focus on God? And there's many other examples of people throughout the Bible that have experienced distractions that have caused them to take their attention off of God. But there's one individual who probably, I would say, experienced more distractions and hardships than anyone else in the New Testament. This person was imprisoned, beaten, whipped, survived a shipwreck, Persecuted, faced death threats, was stoned, dealt with the loss of close friends, arrested, apprehended by a mob, survived an assassination attempt, was even bitten by a snake. I would say that the Apostle Paul experienced many distractions which very easily could have taken his focus off of God and God's mission for him to spread the gospel. Paul says that through all of his sufferings, through all of distraction, all the distractions, this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, he says, don't lose heart. It's all worth it. Paul is saying, yes, we are going to suffer. You will suffer like I did, but keep your eyes not on temporary things, but keep your eyes on eternal things the prize of eternal life. That prize will help us to make it through our sufferings and distractions if we focus on that. So how do we, like Paul and like Jesus, maintain our focus solely on God? What is 
the secret of endurance for our lives. Well, I have three things that tell us what those secrets are. The first thing that we need to do is we need to take care of ourselves. We need to take care of not only our bodies, but we need to take care of our souls. And I will be the first one to admit to you that I need to exercise a lot more than I do now. But taking care of our bodies is such a critical part of being a Christian because if we don't take care of our bodies, the temples of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, then maybe we're not going to be around as long as God wants us to, to make a difference for God and God's kingdom. If we neglect our health, it is in a way neglecting God's call for us to love one another. If we don't take care of our bodies, our lives aren't going to be on earth as long as God wants us to, and we're not going to therefore be able to proclaim the gospel to as many people as God wants us to. But with that said, it's a simple fact of life, right, that at some point our life on this earth is going to end. And Benjamin Franklin said it best when he said, in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Inevitable, right? This must and will happen that our bodies will give way to death. But the promise that we have in the gospel is through Jesus Christ we have eternal life. Our souls, our spirits will live on. So what is Paul telling us in the reading from 2 Corinthians? He's saying, yes, your bodies are going to age. Yes, you will physically and mentally waste away. But if we live our lives solely focused on the physical, our physical bodies, on the physical world, we will ultimately be disappointed. Because that focus is on something that's temporary. That focus is on something that's going to end. But what if we changed our focus? What if we take those things that weaken us physically and mentally, what if we take the things that the world throws our way and turn them into something that can strengthen our inner souls, which are going to live on into eternity? Something in which we turn closer to God and increase our trust and faith in God. It's this strengthening of our souls, not just our body, focusing on the unseen part of our lives that Paul tells us that's what's eternal. That's what's going to bring you joy when you focus on that. So when we turn our, when we do that, we turn that downward trek into certain death into an uphill climb that's going to continue forever. It's an uphill climb that will lead to God's presence both here on this earth and into eternity. And when we focus like that, we don't have to fear the passage of time because instead of focusing on death, we're going to grow our eagerness to see God. So the second secret is to Remember the promises in the Bible, especially the prize that's waiting all of us eternal life. My youngest son just concluded his outdoor track season. He competed in a number of events, including the long jump, the triple jump, the 400 meter, the 800 meter races. Now, he doesn't race in them, but there are also a 1600 and a 3200 meter race, or one and two mile races. Now, for those of you that don't know, most, if not all, tracks, one lap around is 400 meters, okay? And I don't know about many of you, but as I watch these races unfolding before me, and, and I did cross country in high school, but just wanting one or two laps around a track that just never ends would seem like a chore, let alone four or eight times around that track. And if you ask anybody who's run a, long, run a long race like that, or even a half marathon, or a 5K, 10K, or a full marathon, if you ask them, what's your motivation? How do you endure such a long and grueling race? I would be willing to say that it's a good chance that their answer would be something like Paul said in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, and I paraphrase here, Paul said, forget what lies behind. Forget the pain that you're going through. 
strain forward, push hard to what lies in front of you. Remember the goal, the finish line, the prize, eternal life with God. Or said another way, keep things in perspective. Remember how short our life is here on earth compared to spending eternity with God. The third secret is to fix your eyes on the unseen or seek out God in everything that you do. I don't think many of us, when we're in nature, have trouble seeing God anywhere in creation, whether it's a hike in the Adirondacks or the Lake Loop Trail at Beaver Lake or sitting on your front or back porch listening to birds, it's very easy to feel the presence of God. But how many of you have trouble seeing God in the ordinary? Do you see God in that annoying pet who does not stop barking? That one I'm preaching to myself, by the way. Or that coworker who's dumping all of their problems on you, and you want to listen, but you have 15 deadlines that you have to get done in the next hour and a half. That boss who never gives a compliment and never ever nicely asks you to do anything. Or that person who cut you off coming to church this morning or maybe recently going to get groceries. It's hard to see God in those moments. But whether it's the ordinary or the extraordinary, I encourage all of us to seek out God in everything. When we fix our eyes and our minds on Jesus and make God the center of everything we do, there are a few things that happen. Proverbs 3 says that God's going to direct our paths when we put complete trust in him. Proverbs 4 says God will make level paths for our feet and keep our feet from doing evil. Isaiah 26 says God will keep us in perfect peace. And Psalm 27 says when we fix our eyes on God, the light of the world, we have nothing to fear. Philippians 4 says, the peace of God will then guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So as I see it, we can live and endure the race of life in one of two ways. The first way is we can look at it as a slow, never-ending event in which we are constantly bombarded with distractions that take us away from God. Or, two, we, we can view it as a fast-moving journey with God, constantly by our side, helping us through those distractions. Robert Louis Stevenson once told of an old buyerman or a person who worked at a cow shed. And someone was sympathizing with that person about their daily work in the midst of the muck of a cow shed and asked how that person could go about doing that same work day in and day out. And the buyerman answered, the person that has something beyond never needs to worry. So how do you endure the distractions of life? What is the secret to enduring those distractions and those hardships? Well, the secret is threefold. Take care of your body and your soul, especially your soul. Stay focused on the prize that we call eternal life. And lastly, fix your eyes on God and see God in everything that you do. And if we live our earthly lives always focused on God, the unseen, eternal life, we can and we will make it through anything. And we will endure anything. Anything that comes our way in life. So don't delay. Fix your eyes on God and be on your way. Amen.
Please join with me during a time of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you are our God and that you alone are worthy of all of our honor and praise. Because you have picked us up out of the miry clay and you have set our feet upon the rock of our salvation, who is Jesus Christ. Thank you that you have the words of eternal life and thank you for your precious promise that nothing in heaven or on earth is able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. You alone, God, are worthy of our allegiance, our love, and we praise you that we may rest securely in your arms knowing that you have the word of eternal life. Lord, as we navigate through this world, we thank you that you have promised to be with us no matter what difficulties or dangers may cross our paths. Keep us, we pray, from all perils, from all problems, from all persecutions that we may encounter and may we remain firm to the end and enabled to persevere and endure through the midst of all our trials. Thank you that there is no situation in life that is outside of your control and that you have every circumstance covered by your sufficient grace. Lord, as we steer through our world, may we keep our confidence in you and place every need that we have into your hands, knowing that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We pray for peace in this world. We pray for all of those who are in harm's way. We pray for those that are sick. And we lift up to you and pray for those people and situations that are weighing heavily on our hearts and in our minds this morning. We lift them all up to you, God, during this moment of silence. Together, we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us thank God. Holy God, loving creator, close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for your constant love for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life. For all people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who comforts us, teaches us all things, and binds us together as your people. Hear us now as we sing our praises to you. Holy, 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 my heart. Please be seated. We remember the night when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room for the Passover meal. 
where Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke the bread. And passed it among his disciples saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Jesus also took a cup, gave thanks and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in your glory. All are welcome to receive the bread and the cup. You probably know the routine by now. Please proceed to the front of the uh, outer aisles. You'll be directed by one of our ushers. Please receive the bread as soon as you get it. Then come to the center table where you'll be given a sealed cup of juice. Wait to drink that. We will drink of it together towards the end of this part. And then if you'd like a gluten-free cracker, that option is on the center table as well. This cup is the blood of Christ shed for us all. Let us now drink together. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for feeding us with the bread of life. We thank you for your love and care, for uniting us with a company of all faithful people, and especially for the gift of eternal life. We now offer ourselves to serve you in the world in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Please stand. Amen. 